40 million dollar slaves the rise fall and redemption of the black athlete by William C. Roden prologue the title of this book comes from the remark made by a white spectator during a professional basketball game in Los Angeles the comment was aimed at Larry Johnson then a player with the New York Knicks the previous season Johnson had referred to some of his Knicks teammates as rebel slaves unleashing a storm of controversy that night in Los Angeles as his team headed toward the bench during a timeout a heckler yelled out Johnson you're nothing but a 40 million dollar slave when I began writing this book in the spring of 1997 the title that initially came to mind was lost tribe wandering an idea inspired by the biblical book of Exodus which tells the story of the Israelites flight from bondage in Egypt to the promised land it seemed like an apt comparison virtually from the moment enslaved Africans came face to face with Christianity Exodus became emblematic of our journey from Africa to the New World though with a paradoxical twist for generations of European immigrants the United States was the promised land the land of milk and honey for enslaved African Americans America became that Egypt from the book of Exodus the quest to find the promised land in this new Egypt has been for many a never-ending journey through a succession of ostensible promised lands none of which has turned out to be the final destination this has certainly been the case for black athletes who've journeyed from slavery to segregation to an exploitive integrated sports world never finding a true promised land the image of a tribe of athletes crossing a dusty desolate wilderness sustained by the faith that there is an ultimate destination remained my inspiration as I wrote this book black athletes appeared to me to be a multifaceted tribe whose march across time and against tremendous odds put an indelible stamp on the culture and psyche of this country eight years later lost tribe wandering has become forty million dollar slaves how did the book's title make such a jarring leap from the impressionistic lost tribe wandering to a more provocative one this new title cuts to the chase in describing the white wealth black labor condition that has merely changed forms from generation to generation footnote see Claude Anderson's book white wealth black labor and the footnote even in 2005 with african-american athletes making up a so-called majority in professional football and basketball and a significant minority in major league baseball access to power and control has been choked off the power relationship that had been established on the plantation has not changed even if the circumstances around it have the use of the language of slavery in any variation always strikes an exposed nerve in the United States the result of guilt denial and deep-rooted anger and frustration over the inescapable reality that our country's foundations are buried in the fields of slave plantations so the inevitable question will be asked how can you use slavery and forty million dollars in the same breath even Bob Johnson the owner of the Charlotte Bobcats and an African-American raised the question during an interview for this book after I told Johnson the title of my book he said quote I'm not quite sure making twelve million dollars a year playing 82 basketball games is called a plantation if it is I know a whole lot of folks who want to be on that plantation Johnson added I'm not sure the plantation to plantation metaphor works because you have to explain how a guy gets paid that much money for doing basically what people do in the street every day 
end quote. Later, though, during the same interview, Johnson conceded that from an athlete's perspective, professional sports might be a plantation of sorts. Quote, Do the players see themselves on a plantation? I think they do, and that all of the owners are white. That creates the dynamic. The owners are white, the coaches work for the white owners, and the industry is run by white commissioners. Anyone who exercises power over them is white, and they feel or believe that the owners are taking more value out of them than what the owners are putting in. End quote. To the general public, athletes have achieved the promised land, and their salaries are always a part of the discussion. The inference, never far from the surface, is that they should be grateful, more grateful than their white peers, for the money they make. David Falk, the sports attorney who helped make Michael Jordan into a global icon, recalled a negotiation session with the Knicks in 1991. After Falk and player Patrick Ewing made an offer, the general manager looked at Ewing and said, quote, How much money is enough? Falk said he knew that Ewing was offended, and so was he. I knew that, in Ewing's mind, that wasn't an economic statement. It wasn't a negotiation statement. It was a racist statement saying, You're a young black man. How much is enough? The celebrity of African-American athletes is still used to make the case that discrimination has disappeared and that integration in the West has created equal opportunity. For many African-American athletes embody the freedom and expanded opportunities that are there for everybody, provided they work hard. The elevated compensation of some players obscures the reality of exploitation and contemporary colonization. Black players have become a significant presence in major team sports, but the sports establishment has tenaciously resisted that presence percolating in equal numbers throughout the industry and positions of authority and control. In 1988, the late Jimmy the Greek Snyder created a firestorm when he said African-American athletes were physically superior because they had been bred for the role. Black athletes, he said, quote, can jump higher and run faster because of their bigger thighs. I'm telling you that the black is the better athlete, and he practices to be the better athlete, and he's bred to be the better athlete because this goes all the way to the Civil War when, during the slave trading, the owner, the slave owner, would breed this big woman so that he would have a big black kid, you see? End quote. Snyder's comments created a knee-jerk reaction and dredged up silly arguments about the merits and lack thereof of black athletes' so-called physical superiority. Those debates for me are like play-action passes, designed to suck you into the line, pump fakes designed to entice you to leave your feet. The more interesting part of Snyder's comment reflects a more substantial concern. He said that the only place white people dominate sports is in coaching, and if blacks take coaching, as I think everyone wants them to, there is not going to be anything left for the white people. This book is a map a look back at roads crossed, a glimpse forward at roads not yet traveled. It's difficult for professional athletes to focus on anything historical beyond yesterday's game. They are so focused on the here and now, the next game, the next season, the next contract, that many have no sense of what came before and none at all of what is coming around the bend. History suggests that African-American athletes should be ever on the lookout. Their predecessors were excluded, blocked, persecuted, and eased out when white owners and management decided they weren't needed or wanted. Today's generation of pro athletes may be wealthy, but they are simultaneously cheered and resented. A tension that cannot last forever. The community of black athletes, like the black community at large, is wealthier and in some ways more powerful than ever before. 
but in many other ways it resembles that wandering lost tribe, a fragmented remnant unable to organize itself to project the collective power it embodies but is afraid to use. Isolated in summer camps and prestigious universities and pampered as the budding millionaires that many of them will become, today's big-time college and professional players are far less prepared to deal with the racial realities that exist in America than any previous generation of athletes. Yet today's racial realities are more complex, less black and white, if you will, than they've ever been before. Tragically, in this their wandering mirrors that of the larger black community, illustrating once again, as if it needed to be, how closely black sporting life reflects the main currents of black life in America. At this unprecedented crossroads, the question is, which way forward? Have we strayed too far from the road our ancestors paved for us? The road we tread as young men and women? Or does the future demand that we strike out on a new path? In either case, we need to have a clearer understanding of how we got here before we can even begin to set a new course. Like the bounty hunter who tracked escaped slaves during America's period of slavery, another bounty hunter of sorts is still on the trail. A century later, pursuing from one promised land to another, this hunter is trying to catch, to replace, and to eliminate those costly $40 million slaves. This is the story of the chase so far. Glistening black bodies on fields of dreams, on battlefield scoring, between defenses seams, tight muscles bulging, ferocious bucks who scratch and claw, say, aw shucks, wasn't much, cream-colored spectators cheer and roar for conquering heroes who conquer no more. Introduction in 1895, Charles Dana, the editor of the New York Sun, warned his readers, We are in the midst of a growing menace. The black man is rapidly forging to the front ranks in athletics, especially in the field of fisticuffs. We are in the midst of a black rise against white supremacy. Dana would be astounded by the completeness of his prediction. The contemporary tribe of African-American athletes has become one of the defining social and cultural forces of the United States' most unique invention, the multi-billion dollar sports industry. Black athletes are running faster and jumping higher than ever before. They earn more money in one season than their predecessors earned during their entire careers. Such contemporary African-American athletes as LeBron James, Michael Vick, and Tiger Woods are worshipped almost as gods. At a time when the number of black males attending college is increasing at a slower rate than the number being incarcerated, young black men with stellar athletic ability are still hotly pursued, coddled, and showered with gifts for a promise to attend major colleges and universities. Black faces and black bodies are used to sell everything from clothing to deodorant and soft drinks. Their gestures, colorful language, and overall style are used by Madison Avenue to project the feel and fashion of inner-city America to an eager global marketplace. They're the stealth ambassadors of hip-hop culture and capitalism, bridges between the street and the mainstream. No longer with hat in hand, the contemporary black athlete, represented by an impressive, mostly white armada of advisors, demands rather than ask. Many are showered with gifts and favors without even having to ask. Who could possibly call these powerful, globe-straddling icons failures? I do. Today, perhaps more than at any other juncture of their long, rich journey, black athletes are lost. 
Despite their 50-year rise to prominence on the fields of integrated sports, African-American athletes, male and female, still find themselves on the periphery of true power in the industry their talent built. In the public mind, the black athlete is still largely feared and despised, in keeping with the history of black Americans, whose success is often seen as an imminent danger. Every African American accomplishment in sports has, for more than two centuries now, triggered a knee-jerk backlash from forces within the white majority. The strategies of the white reactionaries have been predictable to take back, dilute, divide, and push back any black achievement in an effort to restore the same balance of power that has existed in this country since slavery. One in which the bulk of the rewards reaped from the black talent and labor are distributed to and serve to perpetuate white power. And just as predictably, black athletes have been slow to see the backlash coming until they have been swamped by it, finding themselves struggling just to survive. In their failure to heed the lessons of history, today's black athletes are squandering the best opportunities yet for acquiring real power in the sports industry. This is not the heartwarming and triumphant narrative to which many of us have become accustomed. The inspirational reel that goes from victory to victory, from Jackie Robinson breaking into the major leagues to Arthur Ashe winning at Wimbledon, to Muhammad Ali lighting the Olympic torch. This, in truth, is a more complicated tale of continuous struggle, a narrative of victory and defeat, advance and retreat, the story of an inspiring rise, an unnecessary fall, and an uncertain future. Why are today's athletes so lost? The answer lies mainly in the succession of devastating spiritual losses black athletes have sustained since they began participating in integrated sports. The most significant of these has been the loss of mission, a mission informed by a sense of connection to the larger African American community and a sense of responsibility to the legacy of struggle that made possible this generation's phenomenal material success. This sense of mission has been a cornerstone of African American survival, a source of strength and inspiration. A sense of being part of a larger cause has historically permeated nearly every action of the black athlete. For many of our prominent athletes of every race, their victories were fueled in part by the notion that they represented something larger than themselves, that they embodied the values and aspirations of a people. Black athletes have symbolically carried the weight of a race's eternal burden of proof. Their performances were among the most visible evidences that blacks, as a community, were good enough, smart enough, strong enough, brave enough, indeed, human enough, to share in the fruits of this nation with full citizenship and humanity. For much of this century, the black athlete has, for the most part, carried that burden in public and before the world with style, grace, power, and nobility. The black physical presence in the United States has become part of our collective folklore. The physical feats of our athletes are metaphors for what African Americans might do on level playing fields in other aspects of society. But today, when so many black athletes have little or no sense of who or what came before, there is no sense of mission, no sense of the athlete as part of a larger community, as a foot soldier in a larger struggle. Young athletes, and many older ones, have dropped the thread that joins them to that struggle. They often have little or no understanding that they are part of a long and rich tradition. Black athletes attend some of the nation's most prestigious universities, but many are largely unaware of the depth and significance of their athletic roots. 
Many of their coaches aren't familiar with the history either. If they are, many of them fail to encourage athletes to explore their roots, lest they become distracted from the task at hand, shooting, jumping, running, fast and hard. A number of years ago, I was standing on the Seton Hall University campus talking with Mike Brown, at the time an assistant basketball coach. T'Chaka Ship, then a talented freshman player, was walking across campus wearing an Ethiopian clown's baseball cap from the Negro Leagues. Mike complimented Ship on his cap and asked him whether he knew anything about the clowns. Ship said he didn't. He bought the cap because it looked sharp. Brown asked, Do you know about the Negro Leagues? Ship shook his head. Brown continued, You know there was a time that blacks couldn't play Major League Baseball, don't you? Ship looked at Brown incredulously and said, Coach, get the fuck out of here. Ship's stunned reaction was rooted in ignorance of history, not in contempt. But that doesn't make it any less shocking or excusable. Shortly after his encounter with T'Chaka Ship, Mike Brown went out and bought Negro League baseball caps for the entire team and had them each write a brief essay on the teams and their star players. Other coaches have also attempted to remedy the historical blind spot of contemporary players. John Thompson, for instance, when he was still head basketball coach at Georgetown University, in an effort to paint a wider historical context for their life journeys, took his players to the Civil Rights Museum in Memphis, Tennessee, on the site of the Lorraine Motel where Dr. King was murdered, and to the Baptist Church in Birmingham, Alabama, where in 1963, four little girls were killed when a bomb exploded during Sunday school. If anyone should know the value of history, athletes should. They spend most of their time studying the past. Athletes watch game film incessantly. No responsible coach would think of sending a team into battle without having had his or her team spend hours studying game film. Film allows the viewer to study an opponent's trends and to assess strengths, weaknesses, and tendencies in order to devise strategies for the future. Film provides a means of studying the past to prepare for the future. Coaches do not, as a rule, demand that their black athletes study their historical past, and this has created a vacuum. The magnitude of the vacuum was articulated a few years ago by a young girl at Joan of Arc Elementary School in New York, since renamed, who asked me, who was the first white player to integrate the NBA? For many of us over 50 who were born in the United States, the idea of any player not knowing the story of Jackie Robinson is blasphemous. It's like not knowing about Rosa Parks, the Black Panthers, Martin Luther King, or the Montgomery, Alabama bus boycotts. For people of my generation, the wide spectrum of black resistance and conflict are carved into our hearts. Those events remain so vivid and represent such powerful emotional benchmarks in the ongoing struggle that it is inconceivable to us that anyone could forget. We remember the history of struggle. We recall the terms on which liberation was won. We understand how much distance has been covered, but we also know how much more distance remains. I have to remind myself that for athletes born after 1970, these memories are like outtakes from a grainy newsreel or epic myths from a long lost era. For the young black athlete, the mere idea that African Americans could not play professional baseball, basketball, or football is beyond comprehension. After all, far from remembering a time of segregated leagues, this generation cannot recall a time when African American athletes were not the dominant force in the mainstream sports landscape. Black athletes of an earlier era were forced by upbringing and circumstance to see themselves as part of a national community. 
They grew up at a time when the black community could still be said to be more or less united in common cause. A cause that transcended class, educational level, and other secondary social categories. For hundreds of years, athletes as diverse as Jack Johnson, Jackie Robinson, Joe Lewis, Wilma Rudolph, and Althea Gibson were part of that larger community. A community linked by a common struggle for human rights in the world's greatest democracy. The goals of that community were clear, to attain power. The nature of that power evolved over time. In the days of shadow slavery, power meant literal freedom, as in the case of Tom Molyneux, a former slave who freed himself to become a champion boxer in England. In the uncertain period after the end of slavery, power meant using freedom to carve out individual success, as in the case of the black jockeys who dominated horse racing in the late 19th century. In the early years of Jim Crow, power meant defying growing white supremacy, as Jack Johnson did in his individualistic way. When segregation became the law of the land, power meant creating our own institutions, like Rube Foster's Negro Leagues, which created economies around sport and allowed for the development of a uniquely black athletic style. In the civil rights era, power meant representing a force for change, both practically and symbolically. In the manner of Muhammad Ali, Jim Brown, or John Carlos and Tommy Smith, the two American runners who raised their fist in protest at the 1968 Mexico City Olympics. In the era of integration, power often meant finding a way to avoid the exploitation of the sports industrial complex and maintain a link to the larger black community, a goal that many black athletes, to their shame, failed to achieve or even attempt. And what defines the quest for power today in our post-integration era when black athletes have become rich and famous and, in some cases, have achieved positions in management, or in the case of Bob Johnson, of the Charlotte Bobcats, even ownership. The quest today is to remember. Black athletic culture, like the rest of African American culture, evolved under the pressure of oppression. At every stage, that oppression, from slavery to segregation, has been struggled against, and in some cases vanquished. But at every turn, lessons were learned, weapons formed, a legacy created. Black athletes have historically struggled against the great problems of American life. In fact, the great problems facing humanity. They have fought dehumanization, an unfair playing field, economic exploitation, and inequalities in power. The legacy of black athletic culture is a fighting spirit, as embodied in fiery characters from Jack Johnson to Kurt Flood. The legacy of the black athlete is an elegant style, developed by physical artists from Willie Mays to Allen Iverson, as a way of showing the humanity, creativity, and the improvisatory spirit of its practitioners. And the legacy of the black athlete is an acceptance of a larger mission as displayed by Muhammad Ali's Stands of Conscience, Tommy Smith's Raised Fist, or Rube Foster's goal of creating an economically viable, independent black baseball league. Each of these legacies was initiated and refined as a response to a specific historical barrier, but the responsibility of black athletes today and of all of us, really, is to understand how those legacies can also shape the future. Ignorance of the past makes it difficult for black athletes today to unite and confront the issues of the present. This contemporary tribe, with access to unprecedented wealth, is lost, precisely because it has failed to complete what New York Sun editor Charles Dana described as the black athletes, quote, rise against white supremacy. On the contrary, African-American athletes, 
blinded by a lack of history of what preceded them, have played a major role in helping maintain an unfair, corrupt, destructive system. Today, the black athlete, while potentially more powerful than ever, is at a historical nadir. When the face of black sports is Kobe Bryant, or Mike Tyson, or even a raging capitalist like Bob Johnson, it's clear that the sense of larger mission has collapsed. A once dominant cultural icon, the inheritor of an outsized legacy of glory and struggle, has become a spectacle that exists at the pleasure of its white owners. African American athletes today have the potential to be so much more than that, and God knows we need them to be more than that. More than politicians or clergy, contemporary black athletes have unfettered access to young minds, even when at times they seem to have lost their own. They exercise phenomenal influence on styles and taste, but their reach could potentially extend so much wider and deeper. For instance, there is growing and persistent poverty in our communities and less access to, or even hope for, a substantially better life among many in the so-called underclass. The divide between the haves and have-nots is greater than ever, but the diminishing of hope among the poorest of the poor is even more troubling. Who better than black athletes to bridge this divide? Many athletes come out of the most economically disadvantaged communities in the nation and have used sports to catapult themselves from poverty to wealth. Occupants of two worlds, the world of the streets and the world of wealth, these athletes can speak from a perch of power and influence while holding the kind of keep it real pedigree that makes them relevant to the core black community. But now that they occupy a position where they can be more than mere symbols of black achievement, where they can actually serve their communities in vital and tangible ways, while also addressing the power imbalance within their own industry from a position of greater strength, they seem most at a loss, lacking purpose and drive. Given the journey that has led them to this point, contemporary black athletes have abdicated their responsibility to the community with treasonous vigor. They stand as living, active proof that it does not necessarily follow that if you make a man rich, you make him free. The contemporary tribe of black athletes is the greatest proof of that yet. But it doesn't have to be this way. Like the Sankofa bird of African mythology, we have to look backward to see our way forward. Studying a history of how black athletes have confronted and mastered a series of obstacles and dilemmas over the centuries gives insight into the contemporary dilemma. It's not nearly hopeless. This book seeks to tell the story of the rise and fall of the black athlete, but also to point the way toward redemption. It will seek to tell this exciting, rich, epic story with honesty and respect for its complexities, but it will also be driven by a sense of purpose to find in that history lessons that will help illuminate the still darkened path to real power for the black athlete. <laughs>